Will Nisley dot com. Will Nisley. CNN 10 is 10 minutes of world news explained. And I'm your anchor, Carl Azus. Thank you for watching this Monday. Thousands of Iraqi civilians, more than 2,300 over this weekend alone, have fled the city of Mosul as the international battle rages on to take control of it back from ISIS terrorists. Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq. It's also ISIS's last major stronghold in the country. So ridding it of ISIS control would be a major setback for the terrorist group, though it still controls other parts of Iraq and Syria. The battle for Mosul's been going on for months. Over the past weekend, dozens of ISIS fighters have been killed in the battle, dozens of civilians have lost their lives, and the toll is cultural as well. The United Nations says ISIS has done a lot of damage to Iraq's heritage, destroying religious and archaeological sites, partly because they don't fit with ISIS's interpretation of Islam, partly because the terrorists have made money by selling Iraq's antiquities on the black market. In the spring of 2015, the extremists meticulously documented their destruction of the ruins of the ancient city of Nimrud. Founded in the 13th century BC. They took their sledgehammers to the city's famous winged bulls, the Lamassu, reducing them to a pile of rubble. Iraqi forces recently retook Nimrud, just south of Mosul. We came to have a look, lone visitors to a lonely hilltop that hasn't seen a tourist in years. The scale of the vandalism that took place here boggles the mind. Only ISIS could turn ruins into ruins. By some estimates in northern Iraq, the extremist group destroyed or severely damaged around 80 sites, archaeological ones like this one, as well as Muslim and Christian shrines. Through the warped lens of ISIS's logic, all idols must be destroyed. Their every action here nothing less than utter contempt for Iraq's rich multi-millennial history. And that includes the remains of the vast Assyrian Empire that once stretched from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea, the ruthless superpower of its day. The statues, the cuneiform inscriptions now lie in pieces, exposed to the elements. In ancient Mesopotamia, ordinary structures like houses or shops were made out of mud bricks. With time, they simply turned into dust. But for the statues of the gods and the kings, they used stone. The purpose was that they would last for eternity. That is, until Isis came along. Archaeologists may someday be able to piece some of this together, but that won't happen until the war against Isis comes to an end. 10 second trivia. What happens on March 20th, 2017? Is it the vernal equinox, spring solstice, Easter, or St. Patrick's Day? Vernal Equinox, a.k.a. the first day of spring, is on Monday, March 20th. But regardless of what Punxsutawney Phil saw on Groundhog Day, spring has been in the air in western Pennsylvania and states throughout the eastern and southern U.S. They've had warmer than average temperatures so far this year. Though there was some heavy snowfall in the American West and North over the weekend during a cold front that made things feel like they normally do in February, thousands of record high temperatures have been recorded this month, contrasted with a few dozen record lows. And forecasters say this week they expect highs of 15 to 20 degrees above average for the East and Southeast. Why? One major factor is probably La Nina. It's a natural climate pattern that brings colder than normal ocean surface temperatures to the Pacific, but it results in warmer than normal temperatures in the American South. Government meteorologists say a relatively weak La Nina event has come and gone, but its impacts could continue through March. Continuing now a sort of spring theme, you might think bees are just smart enough to pollinate, make honey, maybe sting once in a while. 
New research at London's Queen Mary University suggests otherwise, that they're not only able to learn new tricks, but also improve upon what they've seen other bees do. The insect's task was a sort of bee soccer, something they would not have to do in the wild. If they were able to drag the ball to a goal, they'd get a bit of a sugar water as a reward. The study showed that after watching a demonstrator bee score the goal and get the treat, the observer bees quickly learned how to do the same thing. But what's really getting buzz in all this, heh <laughs> heh, is that it wasn't just a case of copying another bee. In some cases, multiple balls were on the field, and bees watched the demonstrator dragging only the farthest ball back to the goal. But when given the chance to do it themselves, the observers would pick the closest ball to get the reward with the least effort. One of the authors of the study concluded that bees are able to accomplish a lot more than scientists previously thought. One of the twins, Mark Kelly, supports an idea that could lift people into the stratosphere without using a single rocket. The stratosphere is part of Earth's upper atmosphere. It's between around 8 and 30 miles over our heads. And while private space flights are estimated to be in the range of a quarter million dollars, a high altitude balloon flight could lift you up, up and away for around $75,000 assuming you're not afraid of heights or not gonna let that keep you from a pressurized capsule that floats 19 miles into the sky. The projected ride would take an hour or two and give you one out of this world view. Tell me a little bit more about the decision to use sort of this old technology of balloons. You know, I've always flown on a rocket ship. You know, I flew fighter airplanes. Uh, this is a little bit different. It doesn't have a lot of moving parts. So we feel we could build a system that can carry about six passengers uh, up into the stratosphere and do it in a very reliable uh, and hopefully safe, safe way. will uh, be able to do the same thing that a satellite could do, whether it's communications or reconnaissance or as a scientific platform. To launch even the cheapest rockets costs, you know, 10 or $20 million. We do it now at a fraction of the cost of launching in a rocket. When are you guys actually gonna be, you know, transporting passengers, paying passengers into the stratosphere? In later part of next year, we could be flying passengers up, uh, up above 100,000 feet into the stratosphere. When I first got, first got to look at the Earth for the first time as a round ball floating in the blackness of space, it was transformative. I mean, it really changed the way that I thought of the planet. Horses, good. Horses on ice, better. Horse racing on ice, 10 out of 10. Across the frozen lake in Switzerland's San Moritz, it's jockeys and horses against the elements in what's known as white turf racing. It's held every year and dates back to 1907, and it includes a few different events, one of the more unique ones being skioring, when the animals pull skiers across the snow at speeds as high as 30 miles per hour. Of course, they're all main events, but that last one's kind of a drag. With the number of competitors taking the reins, jockeying for first right out of the gate at a gallop, you can see how the faint-hearted might shy away with a saddle expression saying, I can't or I'll just have to say nay. I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10.
Hey guys, if you want to get active on my channel, if you want to get that latest stuff, if you want to get the latest blog posts, then click or tap the subscribe button right up here. You can also check out my website with the latest posts right down here. And you can view a random video for yourself right over here. Also, I encourage you guys to check out the description down below.